Ami, hi, it's great to have you here. I know you're a graduate of the Elite Israeli Intelligence Unit 8200. Without divulging too much, uh, how do those experiences translate into building this company? One thing that we're really used to, uh, or I was really used to there, especially after I spent there almost uh, nine or 10 years of my life as an officer, was doing rapid prototyping, trying to get something out there as soon as possible. Because usually we don't set our timelines um, and we have to react. We have to do things quickly and have to work on the first go. So that's something that we really try to recreate in the company, trying to have this rapid prototyping, get something to work really quickly. And it serves it pretty well because uh, we actually managed to go to the market very quickly while developing uh, a pretty unique technology, as you know. And that's why one of the reasons why we really re just recruit people from our unit, people that know how to work with us and work in that type of uh, fast-paced environment. You know, speaking of the technology, part of the reason we made the bet in NIM is, is the technical approach. Why do you think NLP or ML-based approaches haven't worked as well? Uh, there have been a lot of companies trying to solve this, a lot of startups, a lot of big companies, a lot of the big healthcare IT names try to tackle that problem. And they all try to do and use kind of the off the shelf and what they had available uh, NLP technologies that most of them are based on machine learning, deep learning, but there are two or three main problems there. And one, it's really hard to get to a high enough accuracy because at the end of the day, when you're training a model, you're using data, you have to, you have to train your model on some data. And the data that is available out there is based out of, um, well, human coding that's been gathered uh, throughout through years of manual coding. And for the most part, this data is just not accurate enough. And it's really hard to train a model that if you're using that kind of data, then you'll end up like the average coder that unfortunately is just not sufficient enough. So that's one thing. The other thing is in the world of language processing, of natural language processing, those technologies just couldn't solve that those problems yet. All of those machine or deep learning approaches are, well, they're statistical in nature, or what uh, some people might call black box. So even if you can actually train a really good machine or deep learning model that could get to a high enough accuracy and predict codes with good enough accuracy that you can actually submit it to the pairs, when you're not being, when you're not able to actually explain your reasoning behind your coding, you train this black box model could be extremely accurate, but you have no way of explaining your reasoning. And when you're working for the provider side and you're sending claims to the payers, that your only explanation is, well, the computer told me so, it usually doesn't fly. This is what a lot of people will call non-compliant revenue. And that's why we took a very different approach when starting the company. Um, Adam, my co-founder and our CTO, uh, he's a computational linguist by training. A lot of our early employees, actually from the first employee that we have, uh, we hired computational linguists people that are extremely hard to find. And we're using this very unique approach. And you can kind of think about it as kind of a, as a rule-based approach, but not exactly. But the best way to describe it's kind of a rule-based approach that what it gives us, the, first of all, the ability to understand narratives in a very, very high accuracy. We really understand or focus, our emphasis is on understanding the text, the, the notes the physician wrote down on the patient chart. That's what we like to call what we're doing. We don't like calling it NLP, even though we are an NLP company, we like calling it NLU, Natural Language Understanding, because we have much more emphasis on the understanding part of things. With the NLU-based approach, what, what, what's helpful about having these audits available? Well, one thing that our clients are always afraid of is being audited. They're afraid when you're talking with a hospital CFO, one of their main concerns, and they have, well, hundreds more, is getting a knock on the door from Medicare, Medicaid, or the Office of Inspector General, the OIG, asking them why something was coded one way or another. They want to make sure the payers, especially the federal payers, that um, there wasn't any fraudulent claim that was sent uh, in their way. And having those audit trails, those explanations that can really show what was the thought process, why a certain decision was made in the coding process, give them this kind of uh, insurance or give them the confidence to know that it can trust uh, NIMS coding in our engine and can fully divert their coding operations uh, to be fully automated using us. 
I, I do wonder, is there a way that the, you think that this technology could be used to actually change the way that providers are, are coding things, writing their notes? Um, it does. A lot of things that we're, we often see that some providers don't really know or don't remember because there are, there are, and being married to one, I know this, there are a dozen things you have to remember when treating a patient. And there are different guidelines that you have to follow. There's the clinical guidelines, there's the payers guidelines, that's something you have to follow. And those guidelines are there, those protocols, to give the best service or the best treatment to the patient. And if you're following them by the letter, you're also getting reimbursed uh, accordingly. And sometimes a lot, of, a lot of physicians, a lot of providers don't remember all of those uh, different guidelines. That Medicare came up with a new guideline that if you follow that guideline, well, you can make almost double the money and you will give better treatment to the patient. A lot of them don't know about this, didn't know that the protocol would change since the last time somebody told them about it and they're losing all the money because of this. And we actually found that providers are using our audit trails to self-educate themselves to improve their own documentation. And it's not actually, we're only seeing it as improving their, in their own documentation. In reality, they're actually giving the patient a better treatment because now they're following the all the guidelines, providing more for example, review systems. They are reviewing more systems when they're seeing a complex patient. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. As a provider, I do remember there are uh, the dreaded phone calls you get from coders who are telling you that you did something wrong in a long stream of people telling you you're doing things wrong throughout the day. And then you have to log into Epic and figure out you know, which note from nine weeks ago had the missing one point review of systems. Exactly. The idea of automating that process of giving feedback something that could be really helpful to providers. Exactly. And here, instead of waiting for, for about nine weeks until coders actually get to this chart in their queue, with us, it takes about two and a half seconds on average. This is what we're averaging across our clients. So we can send that feedback to our providers, the provider in basically in real time. Yeah, that's awesome. That could be so helpful, uh, reduce a lot of the pain throughout the day of, of, of being a provider. In the in the build of making this investment, we were hearing pretty consistently from health systems that coding is, if not their top pain point, which we did hear from a number of health systems, certainly a top pain point. Could you just speak a little bit to why it's so difficult for health systems and, and if there's anything about sort of the current environment that makes coding even more of a pain point than usual? Sure. So maybe up until four year, years ago, it still kind of made sense for people uh, to do the coding manually. They use a system called ICD-9 that had about 16,000 codes. Um, so if somebody, for example, came with a fractured arm, all you had to code was fractured right arm or left arm. It was pretty easy and straightforward. They since moved to a system called ICD-10 that have more than 20 times more codes. So now you have to know if this bone is fractured, or this bone is fractured, if it's an open, complex fracture. You need to have so much more medical understanding of what happened to the patient when you're reading through the charts. You have to really assess and understand the severity of that patient. A lot of hospitals are seeing that once they move to this new coding system, um, the payers are changing their guidelines, their own internal guidelines all the time on what can go, uh, which diagnosis code can, come, can go with which procedural code. And something that's really hard to educate so many people that are not medical um, personnel, that don't have this kind of training of medical training, um, and it's just becoming extremely more challenging because of this. One thing that we've seen th that I think is a stumbling block for a lot of companies to sort of advance the way that healthcare works is that there's not a lot of people that sort of speak the language and the culture of, of healthcare and also have any sort of technical expertise. They exist, but there's not a lot of them. I, I'm, I'm just curious, how do you think about bridging that gap in terms of um, hiring? Do you hire technical folks? Do you hire healthcare folks? Um, yes, that's actually a really good. That's something that we made a very early on decision that um, we're not going to hire coders. We want somebody, because we're trying to do natural language understanding, or even more specifically, we call it CLU, clinical language understanding. We want to understand the chart and the text, just like a physician, like somebody who, who, who's supposed to read that chart with a medical understanding will read, and that person will be a physician. So we put ourselves that our top hire, hiring in the beginning will be, first of all, physicians who could understand, interpret those charts and give us the guidance. And second of all, physicians who could take part in the development process and the engineering process and the design process of the product. Well, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. Uh, it's great to touch base. And I look forward to working closely with you to build out NIM. Me too.